Well, good morning, church. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Well, did you guys enjoy being led by our student worship band this morning? Would you? It's great. We're Senior Recognition Sunday. We're honoring our seniors. But, you know, there's one big myth that we need to dispel this morning. Everyone talks about our students, talks about our kids, and they talk about how they are the future of the church. Well, biblically, that's not accurate. See, the Bible tells us as soon as we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, we are the church, right? So they're not the future of the church. They are the church right now. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that values the next generation and gives them opportunities to use the gifts that God has given them to bring him honor and glory. So thank you so much, students, for that. I know I've been blessed by having you guys lead us in worship this morning. If you have your Bible, I would want to invite you to turn to the book of John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're continuing our Solid Ground series. We're taking a one-week hiatus from Deuteronomy 6. And this is a message that is for our graduating seniors, but it's one that is for, I think, applicable to each and every one of us. And it's something that we need to um, understand and embrace every single day of our lives as long as the Lord keeps us here. So John chapter 3, we're going to be beginning in verse 22. Yesterday we had a prison... Pretty busy day. I had some even here at church. So just you know, we had our second men's breakfast yesterday, and we had 80 men there. Isn't that incredible? I'm thankful for that. Our guys cook the food, and see, I always wait to eat last. And part of that is you know, in the past, I make sure everybody else eats. But an added benefit is when there is a lot of food left over. I had two breakfast tacos couple pancakes, some bacon. I did not eat lunch. We'll just put it that way. All right. It was awesome. A great time of fellowship. I want to encourage you men to get uh, plugged into that. What a great um, opportunity for fellowship and ministry. And then um, yesterday afternoon, my family went to the Ennis Choir concert. And so as you've heard me sing, you realize I don't have much to do with choir, right? But when I heard that they had a concert and they were going to have the Eagles, Queen, and the Beatles on tap, right? I was like, we're going. Our entire family is going. And we had a great time. Jason, great job. I'm a little sad that you don't have the pink beard still. It had to go. But it was awesome. In the car as we were going home, um, we were trying to listen to that cup song, Kaylin. And I'm trying to figure out how you bounce the cups and sing at the same time, it was ridiculous. Talk to her about that later, all right? But we had a great time at the concert and just a great day yesterday. And it kind of just leads in um, as we think about just so many different opportunities to do all these different things. And when you think about graduation and senior recognition, everyone talks about, hey, you get to step out and man, make a mark and live your dreams and live your best life and all of these cliches that you're going to hear 80 billion times. But what I want us to do is kind of step back as we think about building our lives on the solid ground of the gospel, making Jesus the cornerstone of our lives. I want us to go here to John chapter 3. And just to give you the context of, of where we're going, you see, John the Baptist was the first prophet in 400 years in Israel. He bursts onto the scene. We know he's wearing camel hair, right? He's e eating locusts and honey. And John the Baptist has become something of a celebrity in Israel. People are flocking to hear him preach. He's preaching about the importance of repentance, about living for the Lord. And he continually talks about the Messiah who is going to come. And John attracts a humongous crowd of people. Followers are coming out, they're being baptized, and they're doing all these other things. But he continually talks about the Messiah who's going to come, about the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. And we're going to get into this passage here in John 3. There's this dispute going on. See, John's disciples see Jesus come onto the scene. And all of a sudden, rather than John being the main event, they come in there complaining because people who had been coming and listening to John's preaching are now going and following after Jesus. And they're concerned about that. And they go to John and they want to know, what's going on, John? You had the crowds. What's happening? And we're going to look at John's response to the jealousy of his disciples this morning. So if you would please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. And God's word says this. After this, 
Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside where he spent time with them and baptized. John also was baptized in Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water there. People were coming and being baptized since John had not yet been thrown in prison. Then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who is with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone's going to him. John responded, no one can receive anything unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're thankful for your word. And God, I pray that John 3.30 would not just be a verse that we read, but God, let it be a mantra for our lives. We pray, Lord, each and every day that we would decrease, Lord, and you would increase. God, as I pray, Lord, as we study your word, I pray, God, that we would hide, Lord, our own selfish ambitions, toss them away, let you root them out of our hearts, and God, let us willingly submit every area of our lives to you. So God, Lord, for the next few moments, turn our minds' attention and our hearts' affection to you and to your word. Pray that your spirit would move in this place. We love you, Lord. It's your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. We're going to have an interactive start to my sermon this morning. So I'm going to start a verse, and I want you to finish it, okay? Does this sound good? Psalm 4610. God's word says this, be still, what? And know that I am God. Now, does anybody know the rest of the verse? You see, it continues on. It doesn't stop right there. See, we love to claim that promise. If we're just still, if we cease striving, it says in one translation, if we'll just calm down and focus on the Lord, we can know that he is God and he'll give us that peace that passes all human understanding. So we love to claim that verse. But you see, Psalm 4610 doesn't just stop right there. It continues on. See, God's word says, be still and know that I am God. And then he continues on, I will be exalted in all the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. God says, yes, I'm going to give you that peace that surpasses all human understanding. But I'm doing it so you will go out and you will magnify and you will glorify my name. I don't just give you that peace so you can sit there and feel good about yourself and feel happy and blessed. I give you that peace and that knowledge of my presence so you will live on mission for me and exalt my name among the nations. Sometimes what we can do with this Bible is we'll just flip through it and just try to find all the promises that are applicable to us. And let me tell you, the Bible has a lot of good promises, doesn't it? But what we do is we try to take this Bible and we kind of try to make it all about us instead of all about Jesus. Now I have for you here Senior graduation, recognition, everything like that. I've got a yearbook, very appropriate for today, right? Now, this is what, can can we all be totally honest? We're in church, right? What was the first thing you did when you got your yearbook? Even before you went and asked your friends to write, stay cool in it, right? What did you do when you got your yearbook? Let's be honest. You look for yourself. The first thing you do is you look for yourself. Now, I don't want to bring up any trauma, but if you all know Erin Glenn, who graduated just a couple of years ago, well, she got her senior yearbook, and it was something of a nightmare, okay? You see all these, like, wonderful seniors? Well, her senior picture was not in the yearbook. They messed up, and her picture wasn't in there. How could it be that they printed a whole yearbook but forgot her picture? Well, maybe this yearbook wasn't necessarily about Aaron Glenn, was it? You see, now Ennis did it right. They made her a new yearbook and made sure her picture was in it. 
but you could remove all mention of her from the yearbook and it would still exist. There's still a lot of pages because ultimately while she attended in his high school and she had a part to play in the story of the yearbook, it wasn't, this doesn't say, you know, Aaron Glenn yearbook, right? It says Ennis High School because it's about a high school, not about just an individual. And here's what I would say. I think too often what we do is we take God's word and we treat it like we treat our yearbooks. We flip through and we try to find all the promises that are applicable to us, right? Hey, what sounds good? Oh, Psalm 31. Let me begin with verse three. For you are my rock and my fortress. We love claiming that, right? He continues on though. He says, you lead and guide me. Yes, God, you lead me. Yes, it's all about me. But then he says this, you lead and guide me for your name's sake. There are a ton of incredible promises in God's word for us. But we can't just flip through and just say, let me find these promises. God, you promise to give me a, man, not to, let me have a good life, not to prosper, or to let me prosper, not harm me, to give me a hope and a future, it says in Jeremiah 29. God, I'm gonna claim all these great promises. But ultimately, we understand that this is not about you or it's not about me, is it? This is all about Jesus. And so there are incredible promises for us, yes. But the reason why God gives us those promises is not so we can sit here happy and blessed and feel like, oh, I've got everything going for me. This is great. It's all about me. No, God gives us those promises so we can understand his incredible love for us. And yes, God loved us so much. He sent his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins. And through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I can be made in right relationship with God. I don't want anybody to miss that. It's incredible, God's love for us. But ultimately, what the Bible shows us is that it's not about us at all, is it? And John the Baptist caught on to that fact. You see, his disciples are getting a little jealous John, you were the man. Everyone's coming to listen to you preach. We could have sold some locusts and honey and make a little money on the side, right? And now they're all going to listen to Jesus. And they're jealous. But what does John say? A dispute arose between John's disciples about a Jew about purification. So they came to John and they told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who is with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is going to him. They're saying everyone is going to Jesus. Everyone's going to him. It was all, it seemed like it was all about you for a moment there, John. This yearbook Seemed like it was all about John, and now it's shifted. And what happens when we, uh, we see that shift? You know, sometimes yearbooks are a lot of fun. I, in fact, I have, a, I have a little picture from my college yearbook. I want, I want you guys to see this. This is a lot of fun. All right? Look at that hair. It's migrated, okay? Came south for the winter. But So this is from my freshman year of college before I met Jill. But look at this. What kind of qualities do you look for in a spouse? My ideal wife is a girl who's incredibly intelligent and beyond beautiful. You all see Jill? Check, check, right? We got that. More important than that, she has to think I'm the coolest dude ever. Little bit of a fail there, all right. (laughs) She has to be able to cook some mean enchiladas. If you ever had her enchiladas, yes, amazing. Look how it ends. It'd also be ideal if her parents were loaded so I'd never have to work. My father-in-law's a pastor, didn't quite work out for me. But I said, to this day, I'm still looking for her. That was my yearbook, it was a lot of fun. I found Jill the next year when I was a sophomore. But even if my little funny entry about my future wife had been removed from that yearbook, it would still exist. 
all of us, we could go back to our yearbooks, if they cut out all mentions of you, it would still exist. Because ultimately, it's not about us at all. And what we have to understand is in that same way, what John is saying is, hey, you guys are so focused on this dispute that's going on between, man, oh, oh, it's Jesus getting more followers than me. He's like, you don't understand at all. We've got to center ourselves in something. John responds in verse 27, no one can receive anything unless it's been given to him from heaven. Do you know what? As we start, as we think about how we are going to live our lives, seniors, you're stepping in the next phase of whatever God I would have for you. One thing that you have to understand, one central truth that we see throughout Scripture that John testifies to right here in verse 27 is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. That means God is in control. It's not about us. You know, in John 15, Jesus says that he is the vine, that we are the branches. And he encouraged us to abide in him, to remain in him. Then he says this in John 15, verse 5. He says, remain in me because apart from me, you know what he says? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. John has this understanding. It's not about him at all. It's all about God and God's sovereignty. And seniors, this might actually help lift a burden off of your shoulders a little bit, understanding, hey, it's about him. It's not about you. You live your life not to glorify self, but you live your life to glorify God. And ultimately what we see is For us, success isn't measured in, do we get the money, or the house, or the spouse, or the two and a half kids in the white picket fence? That's not success. Culture might tell you that's the American dream. Success, John tells us, is submitting our lives to Christ and living for Him. Obedience is up to us, but the results are up to God. And the good news about that is it kind of takes the weight off of, oh no, it's not all on me, no. God is in control. And so I submit to him, and I live for him. I obey him, and I trust him with the results. John knew any success that he'd had was a gift from God. So what that did is it also gave John something his followers didn't have in this moment. You notice how they lack any humility whatsoever? They lack humility because they're saying, John, you've got to figure this out. We've got to get more followers over here. They've got to get people following after us. Jesus is stealing your sheep, John. John's like, no, don't you remember? It's never been about me. I've been pointing to him all along. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's how Jesus comes out of the scene in John chapter 1. And John is saying, listen, it's all about God and his sovereignty. No one can receive anything unless it's been given to him from heaven. And then he continues on. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. So is God sovereign? Yes, of course. And he continues on. Just so we all understand, he's saying, disciples, I've told you this many times. I've testified to this. I am not the Messiah. And so for each and every one of us this morning, a truth that we all need to grasp is that we are not the Christ. We're not the Messiah. The world doesn't revolve around us. You know, there's this Egyptian astronomer, Ptolemy, back in the second century. And he argued this. He said, hey, The earth is the center of the universe, and everything revolves around the earth. For centuries, for millennium, they believed this idea. The earth is the center, everything else revolves around it. And he had this guy, Copernicus, who came in and said, well, well, explain to me then the stars and they're moving and, and the tides and all of these different things and the seasons. How does that make sense if the earth is the center? And then you had this guy, Galileo, who started talking about this, how the earth is in the center. We actually revolve around the sun, and Galileo got kicked out of the church for it, right? Because we all love the idea of being 
in the center of the universe. And we all love the idea, selfishly and sinfully, about it being all about us. And John the Baptist tells his followers, hey, I've told you this once. I've told you this twice. I've testified about this many times. You can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. In our culture today, I'd argue many of us need a big, giant gallon of John the Baptist Kool-Aid, right? You know what our culture tells us? Our culture tells us it is all about you. It's all about self, self-care, self this, self that. Stay true to yourself. Do what makes yourself happy. Hey, if it feels good, do it. Pleasure yourself, satisfy yourself. Go and pursue whatever it is that makes you think that will make you feel happy. It's all about you. That's what our culture teaches us. See, the Bible says the exact opposite, doesn't it? The Bible says... Instead of pursuing self-satisfaction, what we actually need to do is we need to pursue self-denial. Instead of deciding that we know what's best for us, the Bible says we submit everything to God and we live for Him and not for ourselves. Culture tells us embrace your truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. And so what we have to do, church, is we have to step back and we have to say, am I going to, like John the Baptist, declare that I am not the Christ? Am I going to declare that it's not about me? Am I going to be willing to say, I'm going to set aside my own desires? And instead, I'm going to pursue Jesus. And Martin Luther tells us that pride it's the chief of all sins. It's because of pride that we do all this. Because pride is us saying, God, we know better than you do what's best for us. God, I know your Bible says it, but you don't understand. No, not for me. That doesn't apply to me, God. I've got this figured out. I know better than you. Think about the garden with the fall, Genesis chapter 3. Satan shows up, and you know what he says to even Adam? He says, if you eat this fruit, you will become like God you'll be like God. It's a lie that we all have bought into time and time and time again. Did God create us? Yes. Does God sustain us? Yes. Are we only here living, breathing, able to come into this worship center because of the grace of God? Yes. And yet many of us, I know I do this all the time, I thank God even though you created me, you designed me, you know what's best for me, God. Hey, in this one area of my life, you don't worry about it. I've got it taken care of. God, I know better than you. God, that's kind of an archaic view, isn't it? I've got this figured out. We've advanced and we've developed and our culture, we're way past all that, God. So I don't really need you to speak into that area of my life. John teaches us so much by this simple statement, I'm not the Messiah. And he reminds us of something. He continues on. Look what he says. He says, I've been sent ahead of him. And then he says this in verse 29. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. In Jewish culture, there's something called the shoshben. And what this is, it's be a combination of, we think about weddings today, it'd be like a combination of the best man and the wedding planner. Okay, so the, the showman you're talking about, man, he's best buddies with the groom. And what his job is, is to make sure the wedding goes off without any issues. All right, what he does is he goes, the showman, there's, there's three main things that he's in charge of, okay? He's setting up the feast afterwards, make sure there's enough food for everybody, make sure the, the food that they have is food that everyone will enjoy. That's part of his job, preparation for the feast. Another thing that he has to do, he is responsible as the best man, as the wedding planner, to invite everyone to the wedding. 
He's got to go around and invite people. He's got to knock on the doors and say, hey, they are getting married. I want you to come. What an incredible, incredible privilege, but also what an incredible responsibility. Make sure people are invited to the wedding feast, invited to the wedding. The third thing that he did is he wanted to make sure that they got the right gifts. He'd go tell them, hey, yeah, no, they don't need 75 blenders, right? <laughs> Let's diversify a little bit. Let's make sure they get the gifts that they need to start their uh, married life together off correctly. So this showman, he had a pretty major role. But he's saying, I stand by, I listen for the groom's voice, and I rejoice greatly, and I want it to be all about the groom. So when I do premarital counseling, and I get everybody up, and we do the, you know, the wedding rehearsal, you know the one thing I tell the groomsmen? I never have to tell bridesmaids, hey, you know, ladies, don't take the attention off the bride. But grooms, I'm like, guys, don't do that, that ridiculous thing you think is going to be funny, right? <laughs> Just don't do it. You stand there, all right, and you don't do anything. It's not about you. You might think it's funny, don't do it. Also, make sure you know you bend your knees every once in a while so you don't pass out, right? But I tell the groomsmen, you stand there, you don't do anything because it's not about you. It's about the bride and the groom and their wedding together. And John the Baptist completely gets this. He says, you guys are arguing about this ridiculous stuff. I don't care if people are leaving me to go follow Jesus. In fact, that's the point. I've been telling people, he's the Lamb of God who's going to take this away, the sins of the world. I want them to go to Jesus. I'm just the Shoshman. I'm just the one who's preparing the way for the groom to come. I am not the Christ. For each and every one of us, we're not the Messiah. It's not about us. The world doesn't revolve around us. We live, we exist to bring God glory. We live for him, not for ourselves. And he continues on. Look what he says. Man, I rejoice greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. And verse 30. He must increase but I must decrease. Jesus must increase. This is a word that's applicable not just to our graduating seniors, but it's applicable to each and every one of us, isn't it? What are we going to do for the rest of our lives? However many days God allows us to have on this earth, who are we going to live for? What are we going to do? This closing statement from John as he's encouraging his followers to have the right perspective. He says, this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He's saying, ultimately, this is where I find joy. I find joy as Jesus increases and as I decrease. This is where my joy is found. So seniors, there's a reason why I, I quoted John 10, 10 before I prayed for you about how the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but Christ has come to give us life and life abundance. So if you want abundant life, if you want your joy to be complete, what you have to understand is it's not about you. It's all about him. And for each and every one of us, if we want our joy to be complete, we find joy when we're living for Jesus and not for ourselves. He must increase, but I must decrease. A weight is lifted off of us when we realize, hey, we're not the hero of our stories. Jesus is. We have to be content to play our role, to point people to him. The story is all about him. It finds its fulfillment in him. And really, our joy increases when we live for him and we focus on him and we live for his glory. 
So seniors and everyone here, as you step into your next phase of life, as you're walking through life, ask yourself, is what I'm doing today, is this thing that I'm pursuing, whatever it is that I'm doing, am I doing this to increase myself? Or am I doing this to increase Jesus? Are you willing to give your whole life to him and say, God, wherever you would lead me, I'll go. Whatever it is you want me to do, I'll do it. Because ultimately, God, I want you to increase. And I want to decrease. I remember when I was in San Antonio, we had a, a student who was feeling called to go do something for God, and he went to China. A 16-year-old went to China on a mission trip. He went to a remote village. And to honor him and the mission team that went, you know what they served him? Congealed duck blood. I love Jesus. I don't know if I love him that much, right? <laughs> Congealed duck blood. I remember what this 16-year-old kid told me. He just said, he said, I was terrified and honored at the same time. He said, I had to eat it, and it was as gross as it sounds. But he said, I, I felt pretty honored. Here I was, a 16-year-old kid, and they were so thankful that I'd come all the way and traveled all the way to their village. And I got to share Jesus with them. So seniors, I don't know if it's going to be congealed duck blood in your future. We can hope not, right? I don't know where you're going to be living. I do know our church has sent out in the past six months two different families that are going to South Asia, to the Middle East, to go and share Christ with those who haven't heard. But wherever God would send you, wherever you would go, if it's just right here in Ennis, you're staying right here, what would happen in our church, in our society, if each and every one of us said, you know what, it's not about me anymore. It's not about my desires. It's not about my preferences. It's not about what I want best. But instead, I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to say, he must increase and I must decrease. What would happen to us? Seniors and all of us, our goal can't be Oh, I want a new job, a better job. I want to make more money. I'm going to graduate and go on and do this. I'm going to marry this person. I'm going to have two and a half kids. I'm going to have the white picket fence. I'm going to have the big house. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. Ultimately, the American dream is not the dream that Jesus has for you and he has for me. Our dream should be exactly what John says. He must increase, but I must decrease. The joy of mine, John says, is complete. See, John had an understanding of what Jesus was going to do. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew Jesus was going to come, pay the penalty for our sins on the cross, then conquer the grave and make a way for me and you and all of us to be in right relationship with God. So that first step in understanding that he must increase is us saying, it's no longer about me. I'm not going to try to do it on my own, in my own strength, in my own power. Instead, I'm going to give my life completely over to the Lord. So there's anyone in here that hasn't yet made that decision, I'd love to talk with you after the service about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And then after we take that step, Really, nothing changes day to day, week to week. Every single morning, we get up and we say, today, he must increase and I must decrease. So we say, I am not the Christ. I'm not. It's not about me. So for our seniors and for everyone here, let's let that weight be lifted off of us. It's not about us. It's not on us. Jesus has already done it. But what we get to do, just like John, is we get to now invite people to that wedding feast. We get to invite them to, the Bible tells us about the wedding supper with the lamb that's going to happen one day. So now what is our responsibility? We decrease and we go out and we share the truth of the gospel. We invite people to come to the wedding. And say, Jesus did it. So we're going to spend the rest of our lives proclaiming that truth. 
He must increase and I must decrease. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We are so thankful for your word. And God, as we think about what it means, Lord, to allow you to increase in our lives, I pray, God, that you would point out in our hearts any areas of our lives where we feel like we know better than you, where we feel like we need to be in charge. God, where we feel like we know better than you do. God, let us in humility submit every area of our lives to you. God, I pray right now, if there's anyone in this room, anyone joining us online that's never made that decision to trust in you, God, I pray that your spirit would be awakening their heart even right now. God, would you remind them of your incredible love for each and every one of us. God, I pray that we would stop trying to make it all about us, that we'd stop thinking that everything revolves around us. God, that we would stop living for selfish gain. I pray, God, that we'd look to you. Lord, that we'd bow to you, that we would declare we must decrease and you must increase. We love you, Lord. To your son's name we pray.